Clinker Factor, the Cement Industry Podcast. Welcome to the Clinker Factor, a podcast from WCA, which looks into the cement industry and its response to climate change, and which covers other topics of interest to, to people in the industry. I'm Ian Riley, CEO of WCA, and your host on the Clinker Factor. And today I'm talking to Raina Nobis. Uh, Raina has a lot of experience in the cement industry, having worked 35 years for Heidelberg Cement. And he's just uh, published a book called The Illustrated History of Cement and Concrete, in which you can find on Amazon and Raina's own site and, and other good bookstores. So Raina, uh, welcome. And um, I wonder if I could start by asking you to give us a brief introduction uh, to yourself and how you came to be in the cement industry. Yeah, uh, Ian, thank you very much for the inv invitation. I used to work in my, during the school time for a cement company um, as a, a worker on the, on the shop floor. And uh, I thought at that time it was a kind of adventurous it was, it was hot, sometimes dirty, and uh, it was also well paid. So I thought, well, maybe I do something within this industry. It sounds interesting and a lot of change and young people can have responsibilities at a young age. So I studied mining engineering and uh, silicate uh, chemistry. Well, after I finished my studies, applied for a job for Heidelberg Cement, and, and, and I got the job. So I worked first as a production engineer after my training. I also uh, worked in um, concrete aggregates, and also I headed the technical uh, center and research center in Heidelberg, Germany. So about four years ago, I retired and thought, well, what should I do now? And um, I know when young people come to work in the cement industry, they have limited knowledge about the background. What is uh, Roman cement? Who invented cement? What did the Greeks do with cement or kind of cement? What was the development in the 19th century and also during the 20th century? So I thought, it would be a big help for, especially for young people who like to learn a little bit about uh, the basics and the background of cement making. And it does look like a, a, a splendid book. I'm looking forward to it. So maybe we can, we can pick a few uh, uh, topics that might be of, of greatest interest. And, and, and let's start just by looking at the early history of cement. So a lot of people will be familiar uh, with the Romans using cement, and obviously the uh, Hagia Sophia in, in, in Istanbul is arguably uh, one of the greatest advertisements for, for concrete in terms of its uh, longevity, uh, scale, and, and beauty. But you go back in the book even further than that to uh, the Egyptians. So, so why don't you run us through the, the early years of cement and how it, how it developed? Yeah, I think um, uh, the early history of cement even starts before the Egyptians um, used to uh, kind of cement. Uh, I started about uh, 12,000 years ago when the first people uh, with some, they used um, some kind of a, a lime uh, to harden their floors. 5,000 years, 8,000 years later, people learned more uh, in detail how to burn lime, to use to whitewash their hearts, to make paintings, but also to kind of glue bricks together. The Phoenicians very early learned that. Then later on, uh, about, I would say about 3000 years um, later, the Egyptians used very limited um, lime and kind of cement in their buildings um, just because it was very difficult to burn lime. It used uh, wood, and even at that time, already the Nile, Nile Delta uh, was kind of tree-free. So it was very expensive to import um, wood for burning lime. So the Egyptians uh, mostly used, used uh, gypsum for their buildings. Um, for the pyramids, they used very limited amounts. 
um, and it was a kind of a mixture between gypsum and lime. So, but uh, then I would say about 1000 before Christ, uh, it is said that the Phoenicians uh, used uh, volcanic ashes uh, to mix with lime to produce a kind of hydraulic lime. Hydraulic lime is much harder than lime and hydraulic lime can also harden underwater, which was extremely important for uh, the Greeks building small harbors. But later, the Greeks uh, carried the knowledge to southern Italy, where they had, um, and this is how probably the Romans learned about uh, making hydraulic lime for their major buildings. The Romans also, of course, as you mentioned, I, uh, Ian, um, developed the um, architecture and building know-how much further, and it became basically the building knowledge for entire Europe for many, many centuries. Let's move forward to the early 19th century. And uh, of course, um, uh, famously, OPC was, uh, was developed uh, in, uh, in the UK. So perhaps you can tell us the story of how OPC developed and uh, uh, the process that the inventors went through. Yeah, uh, basically um, the first ideas came in, in um, uh, Britain at the end of the 18th century when the um, lighthouses were built. So they needed a strong uh, mortar to withstand the, the, um, the sea uh, we stand for a long time in that environment. So William Aspin uh, filed for a patent um, in 1824, a patent for uh, a new type cement, what he called, and he called his Portland cement. And why Portland cement? Because uh, an island in the English Channel uh, sub uh, supplied a lot of limestone for major important buildings in London. And the Portland lime were very famous, had a good image, they were hard, nice in color. So he said, my cement is as white, as hard and durable like the Portland limestone. So the development of the cement took, uh, took some time, didn't it? It wasn't something that was just developed in one go. Um, Asplin kept uh, experimenting with different formulations and uh, it took a while to get that right. I mean, what, what were the key challenges that he faced? Well, the key challenges were certainly that they did not know at what temperature uh, to burn the raw material um, and what was the proportion of limestone and clay, for example, or chalk and clay. So they did not know, is it 30% uh, uh, clay and 70% limestone? Is it 10% clay or 90% limestone? Or does it need iron ore? Does it need um, uh, silicate? Does it need aluminate? They had no clue and they were not able to make any chemical analysis. So they tried to figure out somehow in very primitive methods to um, get a formula what they should do and at what temperature to burn the mixture. So this was basically a process of trial and error, was it? Yeah, absolutely. It was for a long time, I would say, between 1800 and 1850, Aspin, William Aspin had no clue. He was a bricklayer by, uh, by profession, and he had no clue about chemistry and what, what, whatever. So it took uh, many other years and many other people to develop a kind of cement as we know it today. It's good to know we've made some progress since uh, 1860. Um, talking about 1860, I think that's probably about the time that uh, the US started its big uh, in infrastructure expansion, isn't it? And, and, and cement must, must have played a big role there. I think that's something else that you, you cover in the book. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the US in the early 18th, 19th century, they built um, quite a few infrastructure projects. And one project was the Erie Channel, who, uh, which uh, was supposed to link New York City on the Hudson River to Buffalo. Um, the channel um, was being built 
roughly around 1830. And because in the US they had no good building materials, they had to import cement from England. And certainly at that time shipping was expensive. Cement in general was expensive. So they tried to figure out to produce their own cement. So, and uh, there was a young guy, uh, Mr. White, he was an engineer. He was sent to the US to purchase uh, instruments and uh, tools. But then he learned also about the channel projects in the, U in the in England and came back with the idea to produce cement in the US. He figured out, or he also found raw materials upstate New York, which um, was, was good in quality. And uh, it could, uh, he could also produce a kind of natural cement. So the limestone he found was ideal for producing cement. So about 1830, he started to produce a little own cement and replaced to a part uh, imported expensive British cement. So this is why um, the production of cement started in the US. And it really took off uh, in 1900 when the rotary kiln was invented. Also then it was uh, British engineers who came up with the idea to use a um, rotating drum to burn cement. It was not successful first in, in the UK, but uh, very successful in the US. So the US really started off with big production and I would say hundreds of cement, small cement plants jumped up. And, and were they cement plants that we would, we would recognize as being related to today's plants or were they still very different at that point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first cement plants at that time were used uh, um, bottle kilns, in general a batch type operation. Um, only a few shaft kilns were somewhat um, later automized, but also the first rotary kilns were very small, roughly eight feet in diameter and uh, 24 feet long. So very small, very small production, but it was a start, and, but absolutely not comparable uh, today. And as you know, today you have kilns, rotary kilns, they can produce 10,000 tons clinker per day. At that time, a daily production of 10, 15 tons or 20 tons. That was kind of uh, normal at the beginning. So it was a huge, huge um, step from that time to today. So one of the other topics that you, you talk about in, in, in the book is, uh, is China, which also has a very interesting history. Of course, today is by far the world's largest producer. Where did uh, cement production start in, in China? Well, uh, China is a particular case. Uh, China uh, used to be a very long, for many, many generations, a feudal country. The countryside was extremely poor and industry was not, there was no industry at all at, um, for, for a long time. But, um, and they had a very difficult time in the 19th century since uh, European um, countries like um, Britain, France, to a part uh, Germany, uh, they tried to influence the politics in China very much. Um, they liked, of course, to export cement to China, more or less um, hindered in uh, local industry. But the first um, production of cement in China did not start on the mainland. It started in Hong Kong and Macau. British importers um, built the first, uh, called Green Island Cement. The one company or the one plant in Hong Kong is still uh, a major producer of uh, Portland cement. But the mainland China in the very late, in the last years of the 19th century, it was uh, not so much uh, having customers for cement, it was the problem of distributing coal, getting electricity. So there was, there was nothing basically, despite China as major resources for coal, it was very difficult to find coal on the local market. So even coal was imported to China to burn cement. But uh, it uh, took 
uh, the production under Japanese rule, more or less, um, and China was occupied by Japan for quite a few years. Japanese companies moved into China and uh, built quite a few cement plants before the Second World War. Lost everything during the war. After the war, after the let's say the revolution in 1948, all cement plants were obsolete uh, and destroyed. So they had to start from scratch. Uh, the um, Communist Party immediately took over the remaining industry and tried to improve production of steel, cement, electricity, and food, of course. And they had quite a big uh, success. As you probably know, uh, Reiner, I, I worked a long time in China and I used to work for Huaxin Cement. And Huaxin traced its uh, origin back to uh, 1907 during the Qing Dynasty. And then they were, they were refounded after the um, communist uh, takeover and as new China cement, Huaxin uh, cement. So very much follows the story that, uh, that you, were, you were just uh, telling there. It was um, uh, very difficult, I would say, for those companies to stay on the market. Later on, after the Cultural Revolution and the opening in the late 70s, um, the industry in China took off cement industry as well. And you know, today by far, China is the uh, biggest producer of cement worldwide. Yeah, and use also modern production technology. So it came a long way, very long way. Another topic that you, you cover in the book is the use of concrete in war, uh, and in particular in, in the First and Second World Wars. How did concrete come to be used by the armies? Well, um, actually, since the Romans, uh, forces, um, armies, tried to protect themselves against enemies or to control um, trade. One example is the Adrian Wall in England, Scotland, uh, or other fortifications, the big China Wall. But uh, it started basically in 1870 when uh, people figured out the army did uh, trial shootings on walls made from concrete, from um, uh, bricks and other natural stone. And they figured out that concrete is the best protection against grenades or bombs. So it was, became very popular to uh, build fortifications out of concrete. Verdun in France is one example. But later on, the French people were uh, and built the Maginot Line. It is a defense line on the western border uh, on Germany, between Germany and France. So they built huge uh, concrete bunkers. The Germans followed with their Siegfried line in nine, between 1935 and 1945. And huge amounts of concrete were used in those projects. Huge bunkers built. About 30-40% um, of the total production in Germany went on the defense lines. And even bigger uh, is the Atlantic Wall on the shore of France, Holland, Belgium, um, Germany, up to Norway. Hundreds of millions of cubic meters of concrete were used to build big bunkers, big cannon stations. Thousands of people uh, were employed, prisoners of war, uh, people, material, steel, concrete, whatever, machinery, uh, concrete mixers, everything went to those uh, defense lines. So, so Rainer, um, this uh, this book that you've uh, completed is uh, is really a very comprehensive uh, look at the at the history of cement and and very nicely uh, illustrated. But I'm sure that after 35 years in the uh, in the cement industry, you also have some views about we face a huge challenge in the cement and concrete industry in in trying to find uh, ways to uh, reduce and ultimately uh, eliminate the uh, the impact on global warming. What, what are your thoughts about the future of the industry? Yeah, I think um, now we have reached about uh, more than 4 billion tons of cement produced and consumed uh, worldwide. The amount of cement um, produced doubled within the last 15 years. So we reached a level which is extreme uh, in volume. 
China, of course, has a major impact on that. About 58% of all world production is being produced in China. Uh, I personally see a, little, a lot of efforts in the industry. A lot of cement is being put into research first to develop cements with less clinker content. And I believe there is huge uh, opportunities, especially when we talk about uh, volcanic ashes or putzulans worldwide available. So they put a lot of efforts in that issue on research to make durable and long lasting good concrete. But also a lot of money is being spent on carbon dioxide um, sequential uh, carbon capture. Um, there are major projects ongoing in Norway, in Germany, in China, and uh, in other countries to get ahead in what is technically possible and also uh, financially doable. I personally believe that the cement industry will find its way to have a very small environmental footprint in the future, but it will take at least 10 years till uh, major breakthroughs are made. The, uh, it seems to me that we, we have a target to get to zero by 2050, um, and uh, we don't know how to get to zero, but we do know how to reduce by, let's say, a third with the current technologies, as you say, reducing clinker factor, energy efficiency, alternative fuels, and so on. And, um, and, and I think the challenge for us is that within the next 10 years, we've got to develop the technologies to uh, take us the remaining two thirds of the way. And uh, in addition to the carbon capture and storage projects in, in Europe, there's also a lot of interesting uh, carbon capture and uh, usage, uh, usage in mineralization, in, in concrete, in synthetic aggregates. And, and worldwide, we, we use uh, so much building materials if we can find ways of storing CO2. Yeah, but also I, I personally think that uh, long-term um, artificial fuels using uh, green hydrogen to produce um, um, artificial fuels. There's a big project ongoing now here in, Ger big in southern Germany. Um, they use fluidized CO2 from a cement plant and together with hydrogen produce methane uh, to be used in air for airplanes. So there are many, many possibilities and I'm positive we will find ways. Excellent. Well, I think that's probably a very good point to, uh, to leave it, Rainer. It's, um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, just to remind everybody uh, that your book is, is available and, and they can find it in good bookstores and on Amazon. Okay, very good. Bye-bye. Thank you.